So thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I, I got to confess, I didn't think that I did anything that had anything to do with health literacy till Ashana and I uh, started talking about this. And then I realized almost everything I do has to do with health literacy in older adults. My started my career working on, for the Office of Management and Budget here in Washington, D.C., working on long-term care issues and long-term care financing in particular from a federal policy perspective. And I spent most of my career thinking about how are we going to um, essentially reform and create a way to pay for long-term care in this country, thinking that if, if we could just solve that problem, we've solved everything. And, uh, and then I got older. <laughs> And I had family members and friends who started to interact with our health and long-term care system, and I realized that I didn't know anything. And I think one of the most surprising things that I learned in the process of having personal experiences with the system is that just because you have money to pay for something doesn't mean you're going to get good care, and it doesn't mean you're going to be able to find it. You're not going to be able to navigate the system. Um, now, having said that, I still believe we need a financing system, and I'm going to talk about that. So, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to touch on, first and foremost, very specifically, the need for long-term service and supports. What does that mean? What does that population look like? And the challenges that that particular need presents. And, and specifically around information and, um, and tools for navigating the system among family caregivers and the people that they care for. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the solutions that I've seen in the um, kind of in the entrepreneurial space that have, that have risen up to try to address this challenge and why some of those are having, why some of those sort of entrepreneurs and uh, organizations are having difficulty getting traction and solving the problem. Um, and then with a, I will give many, many plugs for um, better funding for area agencies on aging and the state health insurance counseling programs. <laughs> so anyway, um, so let me get started. First and foremost, just to level set here and provide some context, what we are talking about, I use the word frailty here, frailty in old age, a risk we all face, as a shorthand term for an experience we don't have a really good shorthand term for, which is the experience of needing long-term services and supports. And, and that that need arises from having the inability to perform certain types of basic activities of daily living by yourself without assistance from somebody else. So, for example, not being able to take a bath without assistance from someone else, not being able to feed yourself, not being able to dress yourself. Some, these are some of the most basic ones. And when, when we study, and we by we I mean the Urban Institute, <laughs> Uh, who has a wonderful model that estimates the risk of the need for long-term services and supports over the lifetime. So what the Urban Institute has told us through their research is that we can expect everybody who crosses age 65 uh, can expect to need, have a high level of need for long-term services and supports over their lifetime you can, about half of that population can expect to have that need. So let me just say a little bit a little bit differently. If we took this room right now and we divided it in half and all of you were turning 65 tomorrow, half of you would have, would have a need for support around two or more activities of daily living or have some kind of severe cognitive impairment before you died. The other half of you would die first. <laughs> so you would not have the need for long-term service supports, but you all are going to need assistance with two or more activities of daily living. So, but here's the thing about that. First and foremost, a couple of things about that need. So if this room were all women, we would actually draw that line a lot farther over there. Uh, women are much more likely to have a need for long-term service supports before they die. And um, among those of you who do, some of you, about half of you will only need it for about two years. And the other half of you will need it for two or more years. A quarter of you will need it for five or more years. So just, I want you to wrap your brain around that for a second. Imagine not being able to perform two or more activities of daily living by yourself for five or more years, or having a severe cognitive impairment or dementia or Alzheimer's, something like that. So that's what we're talking about here. Very, very uplifting. Um, but, um, but that's the risk that we all face, uh, is the, in the need for having assistance from somebody else and doing really basic life activities. Okay, so how many, so that was a lifetime perspective. I want to just do a quick point in time perspective. So 
we've got about 10% of the population right now that has that high need for long-term service supports among the, oh, I should say, I'm not population, among the over age 65. So I'm focusing just on older adults right now. Um, when you add the um, uh, nursing home population in, we start to, so that 10% is living in the community and you add in the nursing home population, you get closer to 12% of all older adults. So right now, so in living amongst our older adult population, we have about 12% um, uh, about of them who need assistance with two or more activities of daily living. Um, and you can find that there's more of this information and research on a website uh, that is called the Long-Term uh, Quality, Long Quality Alliance um, and uh, LTQA. So I recommend that website for more information about this data. Um, so anyway, let me just... Uh, so one of the things that we know about having a need for long-term services and supports, I've crammed a lot of information onto this one slide, is that first and foremost, so take a look at the right-hand side of the slide, when you have a need for long-term service supports, that is when you are unable to perform multiple activities of daily living, your health care costs are going to be twice on a per capita basis what they would be otherwise even among the population that has five or more chronic conditions. In other words, if you take someone with five or more chronic conditions and you look at their per capita health care spending in Medicare, and then you take, and they don't have any functional impairment, and then you take somebody with high level of functional impairment uh, who also has five or more chronic conditions, that person's, on average, that person's health care costs are going to be twice as high. So um, for those of you who've been involved in some of the discussions of Washington about the high cost population in Medicare and how the high cost population is attributable, you know, there's a small number of people who are attributable for a lot of spending, this, this is the population. And lots of times we characterize them by the chronic conditions alone. We say, oh, you know, chronic conditions, uh, we think of that as the as sort of the uh, descriptor for this population, but really... It is um, the functional impairment that arises from having a chronic condition. So I like to say it's, you know, it's not the disease. It's not the disease, stupid. It's the function that is, the, is really highly related to high health care spending. And so who are these people in terms of their health care coverage? Well, um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. You know, Medicaid is a, Medi the Medicaid program is a really important part of the financing system for long-term services supports. And yet, for that population that I was just showing you, um, uh, hold on. Oops. Let me just go the right. For this population that I'm showing you here, and the, the 3.5 million, um, we've got basically um, only about um, a third of them that actually are eligible for Medicaid. So recently, oh, long-term care, Medicaid, and many policymakers' minds are synonymous, but really at any point in time of that high-need population that's driving that high per capita cost in Medicare, two-thirds of them are actually not eligible for Medicaid. Now, a substantial portion of those are, in fact, low income. So we have a lot of low income people not yet eligible for Medicaid, using a lot of health care spending, and with very high levels of functional impairment. And about 10% of these people are, are uh, of the, among the older adults. OK, so I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this steering wheel here. Bear with me. OK. So um, now where do they live? Well, actually, most of them live at home. Very, and, this is, and this is among, the, again, the high-need older adult population. So I'm, not, I'm talking about people with multiple functional impairments. Um, are not, only a, about a quarter of them are actually living in a nursing home or living in an assisted living facility or some kind of uh, facility-based care. Uh, Three-quarters are living at home. And the vast majority of them, well, almost all of them are being cared for by family caregivers, and about half of them are being cared for exclusively by family caregivers. So this is, um, now, eventually what ends up happening in most situations, particularly when you're talking about that, uh, those people who have those needs that last for five or more years, three or four or five more years, is that eventually they start using paid care of some kind. And so um, if the top bar shows essentially the distribution of dollars that are um, the sources of financing for paying for paid care. So out-of-pocket spending accounts for about 52% of all spending on paid care, 
over a lifetime. So we're back to the lifetime view again. And Medicaid contributes about a third. And then there's some other sources of financing that are in that, in that um, residual. Um, if you're talking about the lifetime spending on home and community-based services, the out-of-pocket contribution is much higher. And this, dis this disparity between the contribution of spending to home and community-based care and nursing home care is really uh, a result of Medicaid policy. So the fact that Medicaid actually pays, uh, guarantees uh, uh, financing for nursing home care and not home and community-based care. Now, I'm telling you all of this because, um, because the, the end result of the long-term care system, financing system that we have today is that, as I mentioned before, families spend, are, are essentially the kind of primary caregiving entity. We're financing our long-term care in this country through the unpaid care of family caregivers, essentially. Um, but in addition to the unpaid hands-on caregiving, I'm talking about the bathing and the eating and the dressing that family members are providing, as we've discussed in multiple other presentations today already, they're also doing a significant amount of management and coordination. And they're also handling a lot of financial, challenging financial issues, challenging legal issues, and as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, challenging family issues. So um, not only are they navigating the medical system, and this is what I'm, I really want to home in on a little bit today, is not so much that because we've had a lot of discussion about that already, but they're also navigating a whole totally separate system, which is the system for long-term services and supports. So this is how would you go about finding a home care worker? How would you go about finding assisted living? How would you go about finding seniors housing or um, adult daycare or a nursing home care? I mean, just think about that for a second in your own lives if you've ever been through it. Um, I once had a... Um, I once had a friend, and um, I'm going to go ahead and move to this slide, um, who's an expert in long-term care. He, he's been working in the field for a long time. He's my mentor, um, Mark Cohen, and he's now at UMass Boston. And he and I were talking about this one time. He said, you know, Ann, he's from Minnesota. I wish I could do his accent. He said, you know, <laughs> um, if I had to find home care for my aunt right now, I don't know what I would do. He's like, I guess I'd just open up the yellow book. So I started calling it the yellow book problem. Uh, but, you know, there is a large and diverse set of information needs that family caregivers and the people that they're caring for are facing when they're in this situation. And uh, we've talked about medical care a lot today, so I won't touch on that too much. But we also, in addition to that, so in addition to that, which isn't as if that isn't enough already, uh, family caregivers are also in their, in their, in their, um, the, the, mem the members of their family they're taking care of are also dealing with legal issues around end of life, um, the financial, you know, ho who's managing the finances, how much money do we have, what's it paying for, uh, who's in charge of it, <laughs> um, that's a big one, but also then how are we going to find that in-home care provider, how are, who are we gonna, how are we going to manage that person, and what is the interaction of that person with the medical system? So, um, and then sort of like additionally, where, where's mom, where mom and dad or my spouse or whoever I'm taking care of, my aunt, my uncle, my neighbor, who, where are they going to live? So these are all of the decisions um, that they're having to make. And I would say they're making them in a, in a vacuum. We don't have an infrastructure to support the kinds of decisions that people have to make. We just simply don't. Now, we have wonderful areas at Agency on Aging, and I live near the, uh, the Iona Senior Services Center, and it's, it's amazing. Um, but we don't really have enough funding for these organizations for them to serve and meet the needs that, that we have for this kind of information and support. So what we're really missing is three things. We need, we need an ability to match families with the right types of service supports based on their goals and preferences we need to be able to support them in the coordination of all of those services, and we need to support them in the communication that they have to engage in between all of the disparate parts of the, of the system. Um, and so I just want to say uh, something really quickly. So, I, so I run this organization called Daughterhood. We have a, <clears throat> it's a, it's a community really of, of women all over the country, many of whom have established their own local, what we call Daughterhood circles. And so I have a lot of interaction with them. They also comment on things through social media, through our website, I get emails. And I did a survey, <clears throat> and I asked them a lot of open-ended questions. And I said, um, 
Can you just describe what your primary challenge is in finding information? Um, and a lot of them just said, you know, first, the, the Internet. So, the, so I actually probably should have put this slide first. I said, where do you go? And, and I apologize because this isn't actually ranked in terms of the frequency of responses, but the top two online resources and friends were by far the most frequently cited sources of information within this. It really was, a, and I should just say it was about 100 respondents out of about 2,000 emails that I sent. So, you know, take that for what you will. But I thought it was still really interesting. Um, and what they said was, look, I can't, you know, I can't find what I need on the internet. It's just, it's too, it's too dispersed. It's too complicated. Um, I'm not sure what I'm searching for. I get so many links. You know, it's just, it's very, it creates a lot of confusion. Um, they, they feel like whenever they put their, you know, their zip code into one of those finders, like you can go to alzheimers.org and you can put your zip code in on home care. And what will come up, I've done this. I challenge all of you to do this. You, or eldercare.gov, which is a wonderful resource, you put your information in and you will get a list of like 60 home care agencies. So then what do you do? Which one do you, I mean, there's nothing sort of beyond that. And then to the extent that there are organizations that you can call and get one-on-one -on -one counseling around which, organ, which like type of service would be right for you, they're often biased sources of information because they're paid based on the sale. So they're like lead generation companies. So... Um, and I just want to say one other quick thing, and um, I'm running out of time, but uh, is that there's an emotional context to all of this. It's super important. It's very one of our speakers earlier today, um, looking for, um, talking about feeling guilty. Much more than I hear from, I don't really hear from caregivers who say to me, I can't find information I need, or I don't understand this, or what do I do? It's more like, I feel so overwhelmed, I feel so guilty, and I feel all alone. That's like absolutely the top things that I hear all the time. It's hard to consume information when you're panicking and you feel overwhelmed. And so, um, and then also they're, you know, they're dealing with, like I said before, like a broad array of challenges. So the other final like negative thing I'll say here is that, um, you know, our healthcare information often excludes long-term care. So we give people a lot of information about how to take care of your medical condition. Here you go. You're going home from the hospital. Here's your patient education information about whatever, whatever. It doesn't say which home care agency to call or what nurse agency or how do you find um, an adult daycare center so you can go back to work. The, you know, it, there's not, there aren't solutions that, that link, that are really patient-centered or centered around that family's needs that extend, you know, kind of throughout the course of the long-term care that they're going to need. So that they're, they're very medically focused in my view. Um, so what we need is a care delivery system that revolves around the consumer and family needs and, um, a, and a way for our value-based delivery system, so-called value-based delivery system to really support this. And I think we probably haven't gone quite far enough. I'm gonna just talk for my last remaining minute and a half. You guys are like, phew. Um, about uh, some of the innovative caregiver solutions. So. All right, so the AAA, as I said, you know, SHIP and all these other programs are underfunded. So we have every entrepreneur in Silicon Valley whose parent has ever needed care or grandparent has ever needed care has come to the conclusion that there's an incredible opportunity for them. And so we have this sort of proliferation of, um, uh, of, of solutions that address sort of these challenges around what I was talking about before, matching, coordination and management, and communication, and um, and you'll ha you have these slides. You'll have these slides. So you can review the description of these later. But um, and the business models really vary in terms. And by business model here, what I mean is how on earth do these organizations make money? <laughs> and as it turns out, you can't really sell a consumer a solution in this space for a whole variety of reasons. And so some of these organizations have tried initially to do that, and then they're like, oh. I can't do that. I need to sell it to someone else. I should sell it to an employer. I should sell it to a provider. I should sell it to a managed care plan. Or I should make it free and charge someone else. So those are the business models. Um, and how do you get to caregivers? So you want to provide better information or support around information and navigation to caregivers and their families. How do you get to them? Well, it's really, really hard to do that. Some folks are going through financial services firms, seniors housing, like I said before, employers. These are their strategies for distributing this information. Um, and like I said before, um, the business models have been incredibly challenging. Um, 
for them to, you know, consumers are really not yet ready to pay themselves out of their own pockets for navigational assistance, despite the fact that they so clearly need it. And um, I'm happy to take questions afterwards about why that is and my theories about that, but I'm, I'm out of time. So thanks very much. <laughs>